My whole life, you see, has been a search for adventure, love, and the perfect sentence of prose. These three goals are linking intrinsically in my mind. It is the pursuit of these objectives that have led me to the four women I have been blessed to call Mrs. Hemingway. I was slightly older than he. I knew I wasn't his first choice. He always pined for his only true love. That was a woman called Agnes. She was a nurse who he met during the Great War when he was wounded in Italy. <laughs> Such a cliche. The injured hero and the nurse who attends to him. You would think a great writer would be able to recognize a cliche when you saw one. Not my Ernest. He was always oblivious to cliches in his own life. Anyway, she turned him down after a whirlwind sexual relationship conducted entirely out of marriage. He documented the whole thing in a farewell to arms. Who she's called Catherine in the You can see why my marriage to Ernest never would have worked out. I always existed in the empty space that Agnes left behind. She got pride of place in one of his award-winning novels and I got his leftover love. I got the trick. I had his affection at first, but eventually he realised that I wasn't her. Ernest and I met in Chicago. It was right after the Great War. He'd been, um, Driving one of those ambulances, you know, for the Red Cross. He was big, strong, handsome. He had a twinkle in his eye. Big dreams in his heart. No, he knew he liked me. I saw his aspirations to be a great writer. And I encouraged him. I told him, darling, follow your dreams. Two of us could have taken on the world. Or so I thought. How am I was? Right after the wedding, we moved to Paris. When we first moved to France, everything was a dream. <laughs> Ernest got a job as a foreign correspondent for the Toronto Star. I don't know who was more excited. Ernest or me. We wined and dined with other great authors. It would also make the pilgrimage. Gertrude Stein. She was one of Ernest's great mentors. Ezra Pound, the crazy poet. France. Scott Fitzgerald and his gorgeous wife Zelda and that pompous Englishman, Ford Maddox Ford. We went to endless parties. We were drunk on our own success. Then we weren't drunk on actual booze. But our life wasn't mere hedonism. Ernest and I went forth and multiplied. When our son Jack was born, it was such a joyful time. 
for Toronto was quite frankly the most boring city I've ever been to. And I yearned for Paris. The three of us moved back to France, practically as soon as I walked out of the maternity ward. And not long after that, Ernest had his first book published, three stories and ten poems. Didn't make too much of a splash, but it was a great start. We were, as I said, always hanging out with other writers from back home. One of them was Pauline Pfeiffer. She and I became close friends. She was a journalist and a deep thinker. But I noticed Ernest started to, um, he started to spend more and more time with her. Eventually, it became obvious. He preferred her over me. Divorcing him was hard. One of the hardest things I've ever done. I had to let him go. Couldn't live with an illusion. I'm not the kind of woman you think I am. I'm not a hussy. I'm a religious woman. I've always sought to be a person of upright character. I didn't marry Ernest for his money. He was still a struggling writer when we first met. It was the year 1926. He had just published his first novel, The Torrents of Spring, but critics seemed to universally despise it. He followed it up with The Sun Also Rises. It sold reasonably well, but had mixed reviews wasn't enough to establish his reputation as a serious author. Even his own mother despised the book. He showed me the letter in which she poured out her scorn. <laughs> as I say, Ernest had little money in those days, whereas I had plenty. My family were wealthy in a way that most people can only dream of. I know I'm blessed to have been born into such privilege, but... I was not content to do simply nothing with my life. That kind of laziness and wastefulness is completely at odds with my faith. Besides which, I've always made my own way in the world. I went to journalism school at the University of Missouri. Other young women called me a pioneer. Modesty prevents me from waxing lyrical about my own talents, but my work was recognized as having exceptional merit. Vogue employed me as a writer, and they sent me to Paris. It was there that I met the Hemingways. I wouldn't say it was love at first sight. Ernest was a married man, after all. Couldn't let myself feel too much. And I liked Hadley. She was a fun, lively, and intelligent woman. She was one of the few people I'd consider to be my intellectual equal, Lord, forgive me for the sin of pride. Hadley became my best friend. We were practically inseparable. We were like queens and Paris was our kingdom. In the mornings, I would write my articles. And in the afternoons and evenings, I was usually with Hadley. And that also meant I was frequently in the company of Ernest. I resisted the attraction I began to feel towards him. I am a Catholic, and adultery is a mortal sin, but strangely enough, it was Ernest's own faith, or rather spiritual journey, which really brought us together. 
he was already attending Catholic masses occasionally, and he said he had found truth in the Holy Mother Church. It was certainly very different from the wishy-washy Protestantism of his upbringing. Hadley came to object to the amount of time spending with Ernest. She divorced him. He asked me to marry him. I was breathtakingly happy. Ernest went through with formally becoming a Catholic. He was received into the church just before our wedding. He promised me he had not converted only in order to be with me. I believed him then. I want to believe him now. We did not stay in Paris. It had too many memories of Hadley. Friends spoke to us of the beauty of Florida, and I immediately knew, intuitively, that it was the place for us. We bought a large property in Key West. For the first time, Ernest had a proper study in which to write. Our life was amazing. But Ernest was restless. When he wasn't writing, he was either drinking at Sloppy Joe's bar or out fishing with his mob. He was a wild man. He could not settle to domesticity. We had two children, Patrick and Gregory, but even they could not quiet an Ernest's never satisfied heart. I was concerned that perhaps Ernest valued his reputation over his family. I thought the immense success of his book, A Farewell to Arms, would bring him peace, but even that changed nothing. One particularly blazing hot summer in Florida, Martha Galhorn came to visit us. She was a journalist just like me, but she was a war correspondent. She had just returned from reporting on the Civil War in Spain. She was inspiring and joyful to be around. Soon she was coming around quite a lot. She was a good friend to me. She was a good friend to Ernest, too. I thought that's all she was to him. But soon it was there was more. They had, if not love, infatuation. I thought my children and I could civilize Ernest. We could not. Ernest would probably never admit it to himself, but I was the perfect wife for him. I was every bit as strong and as adventurous and as unorthodox as he was. And maybe there was a disparity to his idealism, where he lived on a more immediate, less abstract level. He, like so many other men, was not immune to sliding into conventionalism and respectability as he got older. I thought he was different, you know? I thought, well, I guess I just chose not to see what was right in front of me all along. He likes so many other men. My vanity is my greatest flaw, but it goes hand in hand with my honesty. And I'm vain and honest enough to admit that I'm beautiful. I've been married, had affairs. Life's too short to miss out on the moments of happiness. I was even happier when I was with Ernest. He was as wonderful in person as his books made him out to be. His wife Pauline was such a sweetie pie. I enjoyed her company. She had a unique way of seeing the world in all of her flair of life and all of her achievements. She retained an innocence which I had long since lost. She had a profoundly noble spirit, but as much as I liked her, 
I could tell she was not right for Ernest. He needed more than a good Catholic girl could give him. He needed to be unchained, like Prometheus. And I had the key. Obviously, I was never going to be a housewife. I continued with my career. In the global firestorm of 39 to 45, I traveled to every theater of the war camps, Europe, the Middle East, and the Pacific. I saw more combat than many GIs. But dear old Ernest didn't approve. He thought I was abandoning him. He couldn't accept that I am an independent woman. With my own mind, We both reported on the D-Day landings. Although he didn't want me to be there, I went anyway, of course. But by then, he was already carrying on with another woman, Mary Welsh. She was a journalist. He'd met her in London. So of course, Ernest and I were history. I was involved in two wars back then. One against the Nazis, and the other against Ernest. Ernest was the dream come true that I had waited for. I attended Winston Churchill's press conferences. He was a colossus among men. The British people went through so much. The Blitz, the Atlantic Blockade, the rationing, V1 and V2 onslaughts. And I was there, going through it all with them. I was reporting on everything for the folks back in the States. After Pearl Harbor and after Roosevelt finally committed the US to the war, the British treated all Americans like heroes. I loved the excitement and the sense of unity. I married for a second time to Noel. He was also a journalist. He was Australian. I detested his accent, although certain parts of it rubbed off on me. Sucks, right? We had a few years together. Then I met Ernest. He was truly wonderful. He was reporting on the conflict from the front lines. He went to Normandy when our troops landed. He even won a military bronze star for getting so close to the danger without running away to accurately describe the battles in his articles. <laughs> he was so brave. As soon as Ernest and I had divorced our spouses, we got married again to each other. We returned to the US for a while, but eventually settled in Cuba. I gave birth to our daughter, but sadly, she was still born. Ernest already had his three children, but we wanted some together. We wanted our daughter. Ernest's faith dormant rather than extinct came out in such moments. Cuba was a place with everything Ernest adored. Clear seas in which to fish, hot sun, beautiful landscapes, and plentiful inspiration for his writer's imagination. We were happy. No, that is a lie. But our un unhappiness was of the upper class variety. Unlike the unhappiness of working class or unemployed people, which comes from poverty, our discontent was entirely of the cerebral and the excesses of time, which leads to ruminating on the topic of oneself. Ernest traveled the world in search of the missing, something he was looking for we often travelled together. 
We went on safari in Africa. It was glorious, but chaotic. In Uganda, Ernest survived two plane crashes in two days. <laughs> His life is like a joke sometimes. His novel, The Old Man and the Sea, a simple book of less than 100 pages, was applauded as his best. He even won the Nobel Prize in Literature, but was unable to travel to Sweden to receive the award in person because of his injuries from the plane crashes. He'd achieved all that any writer could want. But still, he had an emptiness in his soul. Our life in Cuba was secure because of President Batista. The US supported him. But then the revolution happened. Castro made himself dictator and seized the property of Americans like us. We had to flee the country. We reluctantly returned home. We bought a house in Ketchum, Idaho. Ernest's mental and physical health had already taken him to his wit's end. Our rush departure from Cuba was the last straw. I watched him go through a complete breakdown. I did all that I could to help him, but... <sighs> Ernest was a brilliant man when I first met him. That was the true Ernest. But in the depths of his despair and in his intense distress, I could see someone who needed psychiatric rehabilitation. So, I arranged everything. In the months that followed, Ernest was constantly in and out of hospital. He received every possible kind of treatment, including electric shock therapy. He'd be sent away for a while, the doctors would do all that they could, then he would return home again. One day, he came home for the last time. He was absent. I tried to reach him. I tried to break through his hard exterior shell, but I couldn't. I found him one morning on the ground beside the shotgun he treasured. <laughs> My earnest, our earnest, was no more. I told the priest that he had died in a shooting accident and not that it was suicide. As such, he was indeed buried with a Catholic ceremony. That would have been important to Ernest. I hope he is at peace. I now value peace as the ultimate blessing. I lived my life at an unbelievably fast speed. I lived in pursuit of my dreams and yet Everything I sought seemed to elude me. My dreams always seemed to be fixed in the middle distance. I wish I had slowed down. I wish I had taken the time to breathe. I always searched for love. I wanted to be loved. 
adored, adulated. But if I could go back, if I could do it all again, I would change my focus and my actions. I would give love. I can take none of my material success with me. I wish I could take with me the memory of the joy of love freely given to those who deserve it. My wives deserved that love. They knew how to give love. And for that, they should be celebrated.